Ok, empecemos. Eh, muchas gracias por acompañarnos. Mi nombre es Carlos de la Torre, soy el director del Centro de Estudios Latinoamericanos de la Universidad de Florida y para mí es un verdadero gusto presentar este evento que es parte de la serie de conferencias que se celebran anualmente en la Universidad de Puerto Rico con fondos del Title VI. Este año es especial, no podemos viajar, pero tenemos la suerte de tener estas tecnologías que nos permiten estar a todos en contacto. Este proyecto es parte de la colaboración entre nuestro Centro de Estudios Latinoamericanos en la Universidad de Florida, con la Universidad de Puerto Rico, con el Kimberly Green Latin American and Caribbean Center de la Florida International University y el Centro de Estudios Latinoamericanos y del Caribe, de la Universidad de Nueva York. Nuestro objetivo es fortalecer los estudios sobre América Latina y el Caribe y dar una serie de perspectivas teóricas y metodológicas colaborando con los eh, colegas de Puerto Rico. A nivel eh, personal, quiero indicar que trabajar con colegas puertorriqueños es una de nuestras prioridades y es parte del legado del Centro de Estudios Latinoamericanos de la Universidad de Florida. Me parece que el tema con el que empezamos esta discusión es muy importante, pues el racismo en Puerto Rico y el Caribe es un tema que debe estar en el centro de nuestros debates, como en otras partes de América Latina, pero ahora nos enfocamos en Puerto Rico y el Caribe. Agradezco mucho a la doctora Leni Ureña por organizar este evento y también a Lies Picard y a Omar Duarte. Quiero presentar a nuestra moderadora y comentarista, la doctora Isar Godró, tiene una licenciatura de la Universidad de Puerto Rico y un doctorado en Antropología de la Universidad de California en Santa Cruz. Actualmente es directora del Instituto de Estudios Interdisciplinarios de la Universidad de Puerto Rico. La doctora Godró es autora de Arrancando mitos de raíz, guía para la enseñanza antirracista de la herencia africana en Puerto Rico, publicado en el 2013, y en el 2015 se publicó Scripts of Blackness, Race, Cultural Nationalism en U.S. Colonialism en Puerto Rico. Entonces, te dejo la palabra, eh, Isar. Gracias. Sí, saludos. Eh, muchas gracias por, por la invitación este, a participar de, de este panel. Eh, el Caribe es plurilingüe, así que la, el panel va a ser tanto en español como en inglés. Eh, tenemos colegas que han trabajado sobre, sobre Haití, sobre la República Dominicana, sobre Puerto Rico, y yo estoy bien contenta de, de, de la posibilidad de ¿verdad? participar como moderadora. E, y voy a empezar por presentar a, a Ana Teresa Toro. Este, Ana Teresa es una escritora y periodista que ha dedicado ¿verdad? su trabajo a explorar temas sobre política, colonialismo, feminismo, racismo eh, y los estudios caribeños. Recientemente ha publicado unas columnas también muy importantes en el Nuevo Día sobre eh, todos los debates de racismo que se han dado acá en Puerto Rico. Este, y es autora de una novela y de varios ensayos y, y crónicas. Este, ella va a empezar eh, el panel y luego de ella vamos a tener entonces a, a Zaire Dinsi, a Eduard Paulinho, eh, y a Chantal Berna. Y antes de que ellos hablen, pues yo voy a hablar un poquito de cada uno de ellos, pero ahora con mucho placer los dejo con, con Ana Teresa Toro, que nos va a estar hablando sobre racismo en Puerto Rico. Adelante, Ana Teresa. Muchísimas gracias por, por la presentación y sobre todo muchísimas gracias eh, a este encuentro de universidades por la invitación. Siempre es muy grato cuando las personas que hacemos trabajo, eh, digamos, en los medios de comunicación, tenemos la oportunidad de también eh, aprender y conectarnos con eh, el conocimiento que se maneja desde la academia. Yo creo que ese diálogo eh, que está bastante vivo, sobre todo en las columnas y en las secciones de opinión de los diarios, pues hay que seguirlo cultivando. Bien, yo voy a presentar un texto, lo escribí en inglés pensando en... en en, en ampliar esto, el espectro y, y también porque mucho de lo que hay aquí ya lo he escrito y lo he hablado en español, así que pues para que eh, haya las dos alternativas, eh, un texto que se titula Your Abuela is Here, Racism in Puerto Rico Beyond the Myths Race Experience. Eh, voy a estar leyéndolo y disfrutaré mucho de, de, de escucharles luego y, y de 
tener la oportunidad de contestar sus preguntas. Bien, el texto utiliza como epígrafe, esto, obviamente, el famosísimo poema, un fragmento del famosísimo poema de Fortunato Vizcarrondo, Y tu abuela, ¿a dónde está? Leo el fragmento escogido. Aquí el que no tiene dinga, tiene mandinga, jaja. Ja. Por eso yo te pregunto, ¿y tu abuela, a dónde está? Ayer me dijiste negro, queriéndome a bochornar, mi abuela sale a la sala y la tuya oculta está. La pobre se está muriendo al verse tan maltratada que jalta tu perro le ladra si acaso a la sala va. Y bien que yo la conozco, se llama Siñatata, tú la escondes en la cocina porque prieta de la verdad. It seems like whenever we want to talk about race in Puerto Rico, everyone is suddenly trying to find their abuelas. That phrase, y tu abuela, ¿a dónde está? That could be translated very poorly by saying something like, where are you hiding your grandma? Is a verse from a poem of the same title by Fortunato Vizcarrondo that as poetry usually does, synthesizes perfectly a very complex and profound idea. In Puerto Rico, everyone has African heritage in their blood, in their history, in their ancestry. But that idea is in itself a victory and a contradiction because in the same way it's used in terms of honoring our black roots at the same time works again itself because sometimes it's invoked as an effort of refusing the very existence of racism in the island. How could we be racist if all of us have some level, small or big, of the black heritage? How could we be racist if, it, if in our families there's all colors of the spectrum? How could we be racist if our hips are white and our hair is curly? How could we be racist if we love bomba y plena? If we dance to the rhythms of Cortijo, Ismael Rivera, Cheo Feliciano, and El Gran Combo? How could we be racist if we call each other negrito or negrita out of love, regardless of the color of our skin? How could we be racist if we love Roberto Clemente? How could we be racist if we are so proud to say that Puerto Ricans come in any shape or color, or even more, that a Puerto Rican can be born anywhere? How could we be racist if we are the daughters and sons of the mixed race experience, one of the largest experiments in the history of humanity, a melting pot before there was something called a melting pot? How could we be racist if in most of our, if, if in most of our families we have all of the colors of the spectrum? How could we be racist if every one of us has a black abuela somewhere in our family tree? I could keep going for days, making an infinite list of the countless questions and affirmations that people in Puerto Rico use to insist that our mixed race experience may, magically makes us at sense excuses us from the acknowledgement that there is institutional racism in our country and in our region, and that it operates under the same system of oppression against Black people that we see in the United States and in so many other countries around the world, including all of the Caribbean and Latin American countries. But the thing is that it doesn't. We are in any way the exemption to that hurtful and violent rule. It doesn't matter how far in history we search for that black abuela who so many people think will absolve them. Let's break it down. In the years I've, in, I've interviewed as a journalist, numerous artists, politicians, and anti-racism activists from different countries, I have gotten to the point of understanding something that is somehow a phenomenon or at least a very sad and disturbing metaphor to describe the experience of black people around the world. And it is that in a way, because living and experiencing the world as a black person, and more so as an evidently black person, is like having a second nationality based on an experience that transcends language, culture, and national identities. The experience of being a black person living in France, in the United States, in the Dominican Republic, in Argentina, in Brazil, in Colombia, in Mexico, and in Puerto Rico, among so many other countries, becomes a shared experience that has its foundation, not only in the institution of slavery, but also in the larger global narratives that prevail against Black people, African countries, and against all of the Afro diasporas around the world. 
these narratives sustain the institutionalized racism that have not been dismantled at this point in history. There is a sisterhood and a brotherhood that, is, that, that has very painful roots and is an experience that only Afro-Latinos, Afro-Caribbeans and Afro-Puerto Ricans share with black people around the world. A white Puerto Rican, a mixed race Puerto Rican that looks like me might experience xenophobia, discrimination of the basis of gender identity, language, cultural heritage, or even in some cases because of the color of their skin. But there is no way that an individual or even a collective experience in those terms and regardless of how painful and damaging it could be, represents the same magnitude and social, political, and economic consequences that come from a system so deeply rooted in so many societies as institutional racism does. What I'm trying to say is that there are concrete and enormous limits to the use of the abuela incantation as a lifesaver against the fact that for a system to work out and operate it must be fed daily with the conscience and lack of it of everyone that is not in the side of the oppressed. And it, it doesn't care about what it, what's in your heart, about how many black friends and family members you have, or even about how much black ancestry is in your family tree, in your face, your lips, your hair. If you are not evidently black in Puerto Rico, you don't experience institutional racism the same way. And probably you participate and enable it, it and enable it, if not by ignorance or complicity, you do by means of the culture of skepticism and invisibility that derives from the mixed race experience. I won't use this time to, to define extensively the concept of colorism. Let's just establish that it is a byproduct of racism that discriminates against a person and grants a privilege to another to another one based on how dark or light is the skin, is the color of their skin. Instead, I want to invite all of us to reflect on how that term operates in our families. What are the physical features that are celebrated in so many of our Latino families? How many times have we heard, heard the phrase mejorar la raza? How many times have we used the words pelo malo to talk about ourselves? how many times we have heard that our curly hair or afros are unprofessional. How many times have we said, he is negrito, but he's smart. She's negrita, but beautiful. Why is there always an intense public debate when a black woman becomes Miss Puerto Rico? How many times have we used the diminutive or euphemisms like trigueñito to kind of soften the use of the word negro? Like if by saying it, we are insulting someone and not just describing with dignity and specificity the color of someone's skin. At the same time, it says a lot about our values. If we stop for a moment to look at the way we use the diminutive in different contexts. In Puerto Rico, to be a blanquito has more to do with having money and with the privilege that comes from it than to have fair skin even when the rule is that those two intersect. At the same time, in a context of love and family, to call someone negrito is an expression of deep, of, deep, of deep love and familiarity, and is not necessarily a reference or a description of a person. To my mother, I am her negrita, and some of my very white Puerto Rican friends are called negritos by their loved ones out of love. It might be that even when the institution of racism operates in the island as effectively as anywhere in the world, there are also some pockets where love, connection, and a respect for our Afro-Caribbean ancestry prevails. It's a very small victory, but a victory nonetheless. The recent moment of reckoning about racism in the United States following the death of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, Ahmaud Arbery, and so many others reverberated in the island as well as globally. In Puerto Rico, we must admit that we are a step behind when it comes to this conversation. In the past months, so many afro and activists, my husband included, have, have, have had to fight to first answer the tone-deaf question, is there racism in Puerto Rico? And then offer a long list of painful anecdotes of their experiences with racism to first prove the starting point of the dialogue as a real one, and then enter a debate about racism when this is not a debatable topic. 
it exists, it interferes with every social, economic, political, and even personal, familiar, and intimate interaction a Black person has in its life. Denying that, questioning that, demanding that every Black person in Puerto Rico prove one way or another that it is truth is a way of perpetuating this unjust system and a way of limiting violently the evolution of this dialogue. Also, and in case we have forgotten, it's important to remember not to have the arrogance to think that one's experience constitutes enough knowledge to understand a very complex reality. And also, let's take a moment to remember that if you don't experience the oppression, you're usually blind to it. You don't see it because you're not the oppressed. But if knowing all of this is not enough to honor the claims and voices of so many Black Latinos, just look around, gather some statistics, visit Palenque in Colombia or Loiza in Puerto Rico, visit the border between Haiti and the Dominican Republic, talk to Afro-Peruvians, Afro-Mexican, Afro-Cubans, and ask them about their communities, about the access to education, housing, health, and opportunities in every aspect of life, and you will see systemic racism working as powerful as ever. Ask yourself how many black governors have we had in Puerto Rico? This reminds me of an experience I had as a judge in a prestigious contest of narratives, narrative journalism around Latin America. More than 800 pieces were presented. I read 200 of them and learned about the others with the rest of the judges. There were a lot about violence in every possible way, machismo, indigenous people's struggles, politics, economics, natural disasters and climate change, and a few of the topics that reflect on the beauty of the region and its many cultures. Not one of them discussed the topic of racism and of the Afro-Latino experience. It was absolutely erased from the conversation and from the panoramic view of the region that such a robust sample of topics of interest in Latin America created. That is violence too. Also, it's necessary to consider the different shades and nuances this particular topic has in the island versus the nature of our relation with the United States because there are a lot of misunderstandings. For example, in Puerto Rico, you should not use people of color to describe, a, to describe a black person. Passing these expressions through the filter of the Spanish language and the culture that derives from it, the resulting meaning becomes derogat derogatory and means that if you're using that description, it's because calling someone black is wrong in some way. Afroboricuas have been educating about this a long time demanding the use of negro and negra as a description without diminutives or euphemism. In the United States, it works differently. Identifying yourself as a person of color has to do more with your ethnicity and heritage than with the color of your skin exclu exclusively. That's why so many white Puerto Ricans become personal, persons of color when they move to the United States. When it comes to language, a lot get lost in translation. A few weeks ago, a very famous radio host lost his job in Puerto Rico because he said out loud the N-word. My husband and I were invited by journalist David Bernal to make a video explaining to a local Puerto Rican audience the roots and complexities that come with this word and why we shouldn't use it in local media. The confusion in the comment section of the video on social media illustrated how disconnected we are in terms of the vocabulary that is used in the island versus in the United States. For many of the people who saw the video, the N-word was negrito and not the unspeakable and offensive word we were referring to. But the fact that Puerto Ricans in the island don't have an emotional connection with the word that puts salt in the open wound that's ingrained in the very foundation of the United States doesn't mean that the experience of slavery under the Spanish colonial history and its consequences are not present in our, in our culture today. Also, it doesn't erase the fact that many Black Puerto Ricans who migrated to the United States decades ago experienced the same discrimination as any other African American and many of them participated actively in the fight and the movements against racism in every decade. That story is not taught in our schools. In our schools, 
That's why few people on the island know that Martin Luther King visited Roberto Clemente in Puerto Rico or the dialogues between the Black Panthers and the Young Lords or the amazing and groundbreaking work of Pura Belprea as an influential librarian in New York. We have been part of the civil rights movements in the movement in the US and at the same time, our experience has its own language and references back in the island. And sometimes it's more connected with the Caribbean than with the specificities of the cultural manifestations of racism in the US. It is important to establish those particularities and differences in context. And at the same time, it is important to remember that there is indeed one inexcusable root for racism and it is a system of values based on hate, greed, and the false belief that your skin color determines your worth as a person. Working against that system is an individual and a collective work altogether. It will never be enough to invoke our abuelas because they are here, they are family members, colleagues, or just fellow human beings. And it's about time we stop bringing them up to disguise the uncomfortable and undeniable truth that you could have a black abuela, you could have black ancestry and blackness in your culture and in yourself and still be racist. It's not about what's in your heart, it's about the system you grew up in. And your abuela is here, but she's not here to save you from the shame of recognizing this painful reality. She's here to reclaim her well-deserved dignity. Thank you. Thank you, Ana Teresa. Um, I think that's, that's a great introduction to you know the the dynamics of, of race in Puerto Rico. And thank you so much for for making it so accessible and addressing so so many levels. Uh, and and the, the first two speakers that we're going to have in the panel today uh, are both going to be talking about Puerto Rico. And um, now after Ana Teresa, we're going to have Saire, uh, Dr. Saire Dinsi Flores, who is associate professor. Uh, the Department of Sociology, Latino and Caribbean Studies at Rutgers University. And, and her research focuses on understanding how the urban built environment mediates community life and race. So how space you know, works to, to uh, reify all, all these uh, racial hierarchies in Puerto Rico. Uh, also class, social inequality uh, have been her concerns. And she is the author of the book, Locked In, Locked Out, Gated Communities uh, in a Puerto Rican City, which I recommend and was very useful for my own research. Uh, so I'm, I'm gonna leave you with, with Saire. Uh, Saire, and thank you, Ana Teresa, for, for that first introduction. Thank you so much. Uh, go ahead, Saire, you have yeah. the floor. Yeah, so thank you so much, Isar, for the introduction, and thank you for organizing this panel. Um, there has been so much conversation, uh, you know, about race um, lately um, after four months, uh, um, uh, George, sorry, George Floyd's murder. And I am happy to be here today, not only talking about the, about kind of racism in a general way, but also about um, how we have been studying race um, from the academic um, perspective. So I welcome trying to hit another key perhaps into this conversation and sharing it publicly. Uh, so uh, I'm going to, I have a PowerPoint that I'd like to share and let me see. Uh, share that and then I'll, I'll go forward. Um, I don't see my PowerPoint right now. Let's see. Uh -oh. When you click on share screen, you should have like a pop up window. And in that window, you should see your PowerPoint if, if your PowerPoint file is open. Yeah, it's open, um, but it's not showing. Let me see if I can bring it up now. If you have a lot of screens open, you might have okay. to a couple. Yeah. Now I see it. Okay, so this has been the...
Okay, so um, so I'm calling this uh, presentation Racismo Disimulado, which is very old or hidden racism, race in Puerto Rico and the Caribbean in black and white. And I will start uh, with an autobiographical note. Um, in the center of this picture is my paternal great grandfather, John B. Dinsey, born in 1852. And he's sitting with his, uh, three of his four children. On his left shoulder to our right is my grandfather, born on December 17, 1905. There are two other siblings, two girls, um, which this story won't really touch much on or at all because they are not in my direct family tree, but remain an important reminder of the presence and common erasure of black girls and women in these histories. Just above um, his right shoulder, I've included a picture of his father, my great great grandfather, John W. Dinsey, who on an 1880 register in St. Thomas, um, of, uh, it's a register of free people of color, was noted as being 52 or born in 1828. This picture must have been taken sometime at the turn of the century in the early 19 teens in San Pedro de Macorís on the southern part of Dominican Republic. The clothes and posture suggest someone far removed from the agri of agricultural fields that characterized black life in the hemisphere at the time. And it's the basis of a, of a collaborative documentary project that I am currently um, conducting. Indeed, John Baptist, John Baptist Dinsey, my great grandfather, worked in the offices of the American Ingenio in Ingenio Consuelo, just outside of San Pedro de Macorís in Dominican Republic. And he was able to offer his family a rather privileged class experience, um, at least for those um, who were black. Um, John Baptist Dinsey had been recruited to Dominican Republic by then black Dominican Republic president, Ulysses Ero from St. Thomas. He was a master builder, my grandfather, uh, great grandfather. He built bridges and then worked at the Ingenio. He offered his daughters and sons quite this privileged life, which included sometimes studying in San Germán, Puerto Rico for my grandfather, Juan Bautista Vinci, before he became a merchant marine. Without access to the family's accumulated wealth, my father, Juan B. Vinci, who you might see on the right side of your screen, uh, one son of many, many children he has, uh, did not grow up with his father in El Ingenio, but he did grow up in El Ingenio Consuelo. And he ends up becoming an engineer through a public education at the WAS in uh, Santo Domingo. And he migrates to New York City in 1961, working odd jobs, but remaining politically active. Sorry, I'm gonna, remaining politically active. And then, there is me and my siblings born and raised in Ponce, Puerto Rico, and two of us immigrated to the US. And here you have the story of a Puerto Rico, non-Puerto Rican, Dominican, non-Dominican, American, non-American, but definitely Caribbean black family. History books will tell us that the Puerto Rican family is the great family, multiracial, creole, unblemished by racial differences. Um, but in fact, many of us grew up in this type of Caribbean family where our forefathers, our ancestors intermingled um, uh, with uh, non-Black beings in racial unequal relationships. So while these this history books um, emphasize um, the, the mix um, and the blend into perfect nondescript race, this is the trajectory of my family to challenge the notion of what constitutes a Caribbean and specifically Puerto Rican, not Puerto Rican, racial experience. The truth is that the stories of race in Puerto Rico and in some ways the Caribbean have been told by the victors of a racial rainbow democracy that fails to see a Caribbean world and a Puerto Rican world or a Caribbean world often in black. So here is a picture of my grandfather. You might see him sitting 
leaning towards the back on the left side in the Ingenio Consuelo. And here's a picture of my father, politically active in New York City with the PRD, Partido Revolucionario Dominicano, um, in support of Juan Bosch. And here's the register that shows my family in St. Thomas in 1880 as free people of color. And here's a picture of me in my um, elementary school in Puerto Rico, in Ponce, Puerto Rico. And I'm here on the top right. So all experiences in blackness were transacted, as you can see from there, in racial difference and the powers that attributed. Yet the Gran Familia Puerto Riqueña does not look like me. Through media images and nationalist representations, these societies forging racial hierarchy fail to show the experiences of blacks. Such has also been the popular and academic narrative from concepts like rain rainbow people to claims of we are all black or we are all mixed and hence can be racist. Where mestizaje, a biological, which is essentialist formulation to suggest that we all have black blood or white blood is to really uh, support uh, race as a biological concept, which is not. Um, uh, and it emphasizes that we're all mixed uh, and suggests that by default, we can be racist or have racism. And so appropriately for my work, which focuses on the built environment, we see the production and construction of, of this idea that the Puerto Rican is the person in the foreground. This is a mural in San Germán, Puerto Rico. And you can see who the Puerto Rican is in the foreground. And uh, while Blacks um, are deemed not true Puerto Rican because they represent a root, uh, not a living experience and remain hidden in the background, dead. The logic is that there are no Blacks, there are no whites, there is no race, there is no racism. I'm not touching the indigenous question here because that has multiple other um, avenues um, and conversations um, that I am going to decide not to pursue now, um, but am willing to um, talk more about in another instance or in questions and answers. So many have understood Latin America and the Caribbean as this site where there has been an extensive mixture of races that has resulted in a racial gradient which puts people in close proximity and filial relationships. For a large part of Latin America, the question of race was intrinsically linked to a unifying concept of nation and culture. And so ideologies of mestizaje promoted a one people, one mixed race perspective that saw an adult racial subjects as a threat to national unity. But an inability to point to the segments of the racial order contributed to that idea that race in Latin America is too complex and too ephemeral, which disarms attempts to adequately target racism. The lack of race-based data and a lack of trust in that which is available is a corollary of the idea that it is hard to measure race in Latin America, in the Caribbean, in Puerto Rico, in Dominican Republic, everywhere, and has also hampered attempts to identify the consequences of racial inequality. Giving way to a racismo disimulado, that many over the years, scholars included, most of whom are not black and thus can't really understand what we're talking about when we talk about racism, claim isn't as bad or as bad as it is in the United States. The veil of American imperialism and colonialism imposes attributing race to the evils of US empire. When by the time the US arrived, the institution of slavery was supposedly gone, though not its ongoing impacts. This is the type of racism that Samuel Bentances called the prejudice of having no prejudice long time ago in 1972, and that Isabelo Senon Cruz identified in 1973 as unconscious racism that still had consequences. That I, um, in my workplace and geograph in, through geography, seeing policies that enact inequality and reaffirm race um, in ways that are codified. Um, and uh, what Diane Harris has called uh, hiding in plain sight in the built environment and architecture and design. These sociological concepts and geographical concepts also are like that of colorblind racism. And I like to leverage this concept because I think um, it, it is used colloquially 
in a rather broad way, but I want to specifically talk about the work of colorblindness um, in, uh, in reproducing racial in inequality. So there are three elements of colorblindness suggesting that race is just about skin color. It's not about inequities, that recognizing race is holding on to unscientific notions of racial ideology is the second part of colorblindness. And that racism, third, is a personal problem um, uh, that can be remedied by people you know, being better or being non-racist. Um, it is impossible, actually, we know to be colorblind in a society that is racially and color conscious. Um, and much of the work and the benefits of um, holding a colorblind attitude is that it decouples the present day inequities from their history. And so it provides whites and let's name who, you know, do, does the work of racism, right? Of perpetuating inequality with this psychological comfort where they will find a space that is free of racial tension, um, where they sort of wanna move quickly away from racial identity, um, where we continue to believe in achievement ideology and allows uh, whites to believe that segregation and discrimination are um, things of the past and things that can be overcome easily. And what it does, it, it makes white privilege also invisible um, by removing public discussion in support of programs uh, to address racial inequality. So uh, I think that landscapes are particularly well suited to the masking of, um, of, of, of racial inequality. And here's an example from Puerto Rico. Um, this is El Entierro de Cortijo by Edgardo Rodriguez. Julia, and I'm here, I'm using the translation from uh, excellent translation by Juan, the late Juan Flores, where he says he identifies the ways in which this colorblindness, this um, dissimulado works. Uh, and he, the quote is, I enter that cavernous den of iniquity, the projects, the legendary symbol of all the criminality on the face of our beautiful Puerto Rico, the projects that anti-utopia shares with the myth, the virtue of a meaning that is both bl blurred, blurred, and per perfectly clear, terrifying in its concreteness, yet at the same time vague. And so I suggest that this racismo disimulado really draws power from remaining codified in housing, in policies, in um, uh, the mestizaje myth, um, and saying that we're not um, uh, any color. And we see it bear out in data as well. If we look at, this is data from my work where I asked people to identify racially and, and they lived in either private housing or public housing. These are four communities I interviewed. And, in, and as you see, there is a, um, a proximity to whiteness in private housing that, that um, uh, is true across the board in Puerto Rico, but certainly um, there is a, a avoidance of blackness in private housing relative to public housing. So the geography of race is really attached to this housing cartography, right? To where one lives. And it's one of the ways of not being able to identify where race exists to say, well, we can attend to it. This is um, uh, a cartoon from the early 1990s um, when Rosselló and the Mano Dura was um, the, the talk of the town. And we see Rosselló, father, at the top there in the center. And on, the, on your left is Zoe Lavoy, um, who's, uh, who was appointed by his son as well. Um, but she was then the head of corrections. And um, here we see the representation, the racial representation of who are the ones who are in power and who are the criminal, uh, the, who are depicted um, as the criminal. And there's a firm racial identification here. And I'd like to use this image to say, to kind of challenge the ways in which we think of what we're talking about when we're talking about race in Puerto Rico. Um, how whiteness is represented. So I would say that even El Pueblo, which is the right, you know, um, putting his finger, his um, 
uh, fingers on his ears is also kind of um, a white relative to a black experience in particular, which you can see on the bottom. Um, uh, and here whiteness I suggest is about acceptance, about privilege, racial privilege, rather than a biological um, a blood count of whether you have a drop of, blood, of, of white blood or not, um, but actually a racial experience of privilege, which I would argue is the case for all societies, right? If race is not real and it's a social construct, the only whiteness there is, is the one that is privileged, regardless of blood quantum, the same case for blackness. So, or, or uh, uh, racial underprivilege. So here we see the, the much talked about census results with the majority of Puerto Ricans opting or choosing white um, and uh, uh, very low numbers choosing black. I'll say that the 2019 numbers are from the American Community Survey, which is a sample, which is tend to thought, be thought of as less reliable than a full census count. There are many questions in Puerto Rico of whether these categories are real, accurate or not. But I would say that they still help us do some of the work to address racial inequality. So away from the discursive conversation of what is white and what is black, am I white, am I not black? How do we show um, the ways in which racial difference is, um, is supported by social indicators? And so if you look at social indicators, and this is from uh, the census 2000, we see that there are differences between whoever was it that identified as white and whoever was it that identified as black. But we would think that given what you saw um, based on the, on the um, uh, residential distribution of racial identification, that in fact, there is a, a, the, when those who identify as black have lower socioeconomic indicators across the board. They are, um, there are more people unemployed, more black people who are unemployed, more people who, um, uh, who are below the poverty level. They have less uh, college degrees um, and they have lower uh, incomes. So even if the data is considered to be you know, imperfect, it still helps us kind of pin down how race manifests in the context of Puerto Rico. And we need to know this in order to know how to address employment disparities, how to address um, income disparities, how to address educational, educational disparities by race. So those data, that data can be shown in many different ways. For example, this is a spread and Ana Teresa, I think referred to this, why is, are there no Dominican, um, sorry, no black Puerto Rican uh, governors, none has been Puerto Rican. Well, this is the spread, this is the representation. If we have a population of black Puerto Ricans who are not only geograph geographically lo localized to Loisa, but are all over the island, right, all over the diaspora, right? If we have a population that has less access to employment opportunities, less access to educational opportunities, less access to the sites of power in the island, then this is a reflection of it too. And so in pointing this side of the spectrum, I'm also suggesting that we have to point to, to privilege in this conversation. So um, there was a there was a, a hashtag aquí no hay racismo pero uh, pero no somos racista hashtag um, going around uh, the web and in there uh, apart from being triggered highly triggered and remembering things that I had forgotten about growing up in Puerto Rico but also my travels through the Caribbean. Um, and, you know, uh, that are both about research, but also about personal relationships in the Caribbean. Uh, I also kind of started to think about the stories that are not told in this racial hierarchy, in this racial landscape. And the stories that are not told are those that come from whiteness. So I wonder why are there no high hashtags about aquí yo he participado del racismo, aquí yo me he beneficiado del racismo, I have benefited from racism. Those are necessary also hashtags 
to start addressing because the fact that our sites of power look like this and I challenge, you know, most even including academia, but I would challenge um, uh, all of us to think about the ways in which we um, reproduce white supremacy that is true to the Caribbean. So I started with my family in the picture of me to say that we have always been engaged in this racial story and it crosses borders and it um, uh, erodes nationalistic kind of versions. White supremacy has made um, uh, a concerted effort to be anti-Black um, and anti-Black racism to be a central part of it. So to address it, we have to dispel the notions that these are limited um, to our national sites and really embrace a hemispheric, a Caribbean perspective on the matter. So I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you, Saire, for um, that um, intervention and uh, making us uh, think uh, carefully about space and about the data that even though it's not perfect, the one we do have still shows the, the, the highly stratified uh, society in which we live in Puerto Rico. And we will be, uh, I encourage uh, our listeners to keep asking questions, you know, uh, and then we will address them after all the panelists have, have finished. Um, so the next speaker we have now is, is Edward Paulino. Um, is, he's an associate professor at the Department of Global History at, at CUNY's uh, John Jay College. And he teaches a wide ranging number of writing intensive interdisciplinary courses. Um, and what is interesting about his intervention now is that he's gonna bring to the panel um, the perspective from, you know, the Dominican Republic and its relationship uh, to, to Haiti, his research interest into race, genocide, borders, nation building, uh, Latin America and the Caribbean, the African diaspora and New York state history. So he is doing what Sadie is, is telling us to do is to look at these things globally. Uh, so it's great to have him. He's the author of Dividing Hispaniola, the Dominican Republic's border campaign against Haiti. Uh, so I'm gonna leave you with, with uh, Edward uh, next and, and thank again Saide for, for your intervention and, and we'll have more, more time to speak with Saide and Ana Teresa in the, in the question section. So Edward, um, uh, go on, we, you have the floor. Thank you, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you, at least okay. I can hear you. Great. Okay. Oh, uh, thank you so much for having me uh, and the invitation, Professor Valerio and the University of Florida and the Center for Latin American Studies. Um, in the most recent example of how the Black Lives Matter uh, movement in the U.S. impacted the Dominican Republic, uh, I see the June 9th manifestation called Una Flor para George Floyd, a flower for George Floyd, as representative of this. It occurred in the Dominican capital of Santo Domingo near Parque Independencia, where the Altar de la Patria, the altar to the fatherland is located. There, the three founding fathers of the Dominican nation are interred. This site, El Parque Independencia, is without a doubt, one of the most sacred secular sites in the Dominican Republic. On that sunny Tuesday, several individuals gathered to peacefully remember the life and murder of George Floyd, and by extension, protest global and domestic racism. Video footage captured that of that day violent arbitrary arrests of three persons by police officers. Of the three arrested in that disturbing video, I wanna focus on the two Afro-Dominican women arrested, Ana Maria Velique and Maribel Nunez, and I think the other individual, if I'm not mistaken, Fernando Corona. I wanna use these women protesting racism uh, and kind of connecting to a global kind of movement of blackness and activism as a way to discuss how race and racism uh, affect the daily lives of black Afro-descendientes in the Dominican Republic. Ana Maria Belique uh, is the daughter of Haitian immigrants and a member of Reconocido, uh, Reconocido, one of the founders, an organization in the Dominican Republic dedicated to restoring citizenship rights to Dominicans of Haitian descent, combating anti-Haitianism and racism in Dominican society. 
Ana Maria represents around 120,000 persons who have been stripped or denied access or a path to Dominican citizenship. In essence, stateless people. A situation created by the 168 2013 ruling that essentially stripped all Dominican born children born to undocumented parents in the Dominican Republic of Dominican citizenship or a path to it and made it retroactive uh, to 1929. According to the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees, quote, with a stateless population of Dominican Republic estimated at more than 200,000 people, the consequences of expulsion uh, could be devastating. Uh, because at that time, uh, if you're stateless, then the state has the right to deport, deport you. Uh, 168.13 ruling was a culmination uh, since the early 2000s of gradual restrictions to migration laws more draconian uh, laws uh, and decrees against the Dominican Republic's largest and ethnic racial minority, Haitian immigrants and their descendants. Ana Maria was born and raised in a country where as an adult, her citizenship was denied to her. Dominican Republic was the only country she had ever known. She was also born and raised in a nation where the political elites with the state for generations have seen Haiti as a political card to deflect attention from other social emergencies, like high rates of corruption, femicides, and inequality, right? It's what, you know, uh, President Trump is doing here, right? He's trying to use the Southern strategy of 68 and playing to his mostly white base to see, all, you know, all your problems, you know, they're black or of color or immigrants, right? This discourse uh, over the, the years created a narrative where Haitian equals a historic and eternal enemy and an aggressor of the DR. From anti-Haitian factions during the wars of, of uh, independence that later drove then President Pedro Santana to return to the Dominican Republic to a colony of Spain through Trujillo and his 1937 genocide and then his successor, Joaquin Balaguer's racist campaign against Afro-Dominican presidential candidate uh, and of Haitian descent, Jose Francisco Peña Gomez. Haiti as a Dominican boogeyman has survived uh, in Dominican society, or more specifically, has been cultivated across generations, right? And we have to remember in the 20th century, there is this pull and push where you see genocidal massacre by Trujillo in 1937, but also you have at the same time since the U.S. occupation, this increased dependency on cheap Haitian labor for the, to cut cane in the sugar mills. Uh, that's why you see in 1952, Trujillo uh, signed a state-to-state -state, uh, bilateral agreement uh, with Haiti uh, that would export or sell Haitian workers to the Dominican Repub uh, government. And the, one of the uh, agreements was at the end of the harvest, Dominican government would pay the transport of the Haitian workers back to Haiti, but the Dominican government pocketed the money and uh, allowed uh, the Haitian communities to grow. And ironically later says, oh, look, we've been invaded, but uh, it was uh, economic reasons. Um, uh, at the same time, you have socially stigmatization uh, of Haitians and their descendants in the Dominican Republic, as I just mentioned, related to the labor economy. And here, uh, I suggest authors like Ernesto Sagas and Samuel Martinez, who have done important work on these subjects. So uh, Dominicans of Haitian descent, they're legally excluded through these gradu gradual migration laws. Uh, but also, today, you have the impact of, of statelessness or the impact of COVID on this stateless community in the Dominican Republic, which is evident. Uh, you know, the Institute of Statelessness and Inclusion uh, has reported that birth registrations have been suspended across the world. In the Dominican Republic, this is no different. Uh, here, I recommend the great work of, of, of Mika and Bridget Wooding, uh, who reminds us that in the Dominican Republic, with layoffs and social distancing for weeks, normal, the normal civil registry uh, to declare birth, these procedures, uh, because of COVID, were not available. And now people are told to apply for late registration procedures, uh, but these procedures are, have become even more expensive and complicated because of the COVID epidemic. 
um, and more. And so the, the fear is that more young people could be stateless because they cannot register because of COVID. Um, and we see this also around the world and in the U.S. where the rates of immunizations uh, have decreased because of fear that if you go in to get, you know, the shot for the uh, chicken pox, et cetera, you're going to get the COVID virus. The government response uh, has been uh, tepid. Organizations have been advocating for rights of stateless people in the Dominican Republic. Uh, the Dominican Republic has not responded appropriately and earnestly uh, regarding this community. Uh, particularly because recently they had a presidential and congressional elections where the old uh, PLD party was uh, thrown out, and now you have the new PRM. Um, so everyone now is waiting to see the first 100 days, how the president-elect Abinader is going to address these, these issues that often have been one of the third rails of Dominican politics, which is, you know, Haiti, and their descendants and migratory issues. So... When Dominicans of Haitian descent um, see the uprising in the United States caused by George Floyd's racialized murder, it resonated with this racially and ethnically excluded people, uh, like Anabelique in the Dominican Republic. Uh, and the Dominican state, um, you see the limits of this democracy, uh, especially when it comes to issues uh, when protecting the democratic rights of self-expression, uh, but that self-expression is questioned when you are protesting white supremacy in a land whose history often reveals a pattern that sees uh, Haiti as foreign and anathema to its national and cultural identity. Uh, and this, of course, is also a legacy of colonial empire and fear, uh, and really writ large, a fear of Haiti in the West. Today, Dominicans of Haitian descent in the Dominican Republic are the de facto Afrodescendiente group, meaning that's they, they, they use that marker and that marker it, it, the state uses to read them as such. Like myself and others in the diaspora who are proud of my Dominican heritage as a Dominican American, Dominicans of Haitian descent are also proud of their Haitian ancestry, uh, and rightly so. But in the Dominican Republic, this pride that you see with the Irish in Boston, et cetera, in the US, or in, in, in the Dominican Republic with Arabs, Jews, or even Cocolos, uh, West Indian immigrants, uh, this pride in the Haitian homeland by second, third, fourth generation Dominicans of Haitian descent is seen and taught as treasonous because of the continuing narrative that seeks to position Haiti as the eternal black enemy, quote unquote. You will often hear the refrain that Dominican Republic, uh, in the Dominican Republic that Haiti invaded us quote unquote, and we expelled them to become a free country in 1844. The narrative of invasion has continued thanks to political elites and the state throughout the 20th and 21st century. Uh, and it's important to, to know that recently historians like Roberto Casa, who's the head of the National Archives, has says, had said really that the, the, the national independence and war of liberation uh, should not be read as the one uh, against Haiti, it should be the 1861 uh, to 1865 national liberation against Spanish annexation, annexation where you see these black and mulatto leaders like, uh, you know, Edo, which Saida mentioned, uh, met her, her, uh, her family, and uh, uh, Gregorio Luperon, who, by the way, Gregorio Luperon, a black man, is on the currency uh, one of the bills in the Dominican Republic. And I think it's, it, 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 we can talk about that, you know, in terms of compare and contrast. It's like in the Dominican Republic, with this very complicated history of, of, of self-recognition and race, uh, they have a black person on the, the currency versus the United States that we're still trying to get, you know, one black person like Harriet Tubman and remove Andrew Jackson from the $20 bill. Now, Maribel Nunez, um, is the other Afro-Dominican woman who was arrested with Ana Balique. She is not, uh, from what I know, of Haitian descent, uh, but she represents the majority of non-Haitian Dominicans who are, in fact, black and mulattoes. In other words, the majority of non-white, uh, the majority of Dominicans are non-white, or, you know, they're, they're clearly a majority of African descent, you know, when you incorporate the many different hues of, of the color spectrum, right? And 
uh, we're talking about 11 million people in uh, the Dominican Republic. And census after census, and I studied this in my book, throughout the 20th century, the majority of the, of the group uh, up to the time they used race was uh, mulatto. Uh, and we know there are many who could be black, red as black, but perhaps they might use uh, uh, another, another name. Um, Afro-Dominicans, uh, and this is important, have also a proud legacy, right? And it's important now to just underscore uh, the Dominican Studies Institute's project on the first black in the Americas. Uh, for example, and I quote from their research, the first person of African descent known to have arrived in La Española in modern times in what today is the Dominican Republic, was a Juan Moreno or Juan Prieto, John the Black, a free, by all indications, young black man who accompanied Columbus as a servant in the 1492 and 1493 expeditions, end quote. As a Dominican-American, this history is very powerful example of how I come to think about debates such as 1619 and the importance of reframing our narratives uh, and something that I can talk about in terms of the hemispheric perspective in relations uh, with regards to blackness. Maribel Nunez also knows what the Dominican Studies Institute has research and the great work of Anthony Stevens Acevedo and Lisette Acosta Corniel uh, know that the place that would become the Dominican Republic is the site of the first black rebellion of the Americas in 1521. I want that to sink in, 1521. What would become the Dominican Republic is the place where the first rudimentary underground railroad in the Americas occurred. The first Harriet and Harold Tutmans of the Americas are in what is today the Dominican Republic. The first Cimarrones, the runaway slaves. As Silvia Torres Sayant writes in a seminal uh, article, Tribulations of Blackness, Dominican society is the cradle of blackness in the Americas. But whereas Dominicans of Haitian descent who are targeted for their lack of documentation and race, non-Haitian Afro-Dominicans, uh, who could have documentations or also uh, legal documents also confront similar experiences with the state, i.e. law enforcement, as their African-American and Latino counterparts in the U.S. The article de Minnesota La Cienega, o el peligro de ser un hombre, un hombre negro empobrecido o de clase trabajadora, in the Caribe newspaper article, talks about how Black Dominicans, young Dominicans from poor areas are, are, are constantly profiled because of their skin. Jack Valenzuela says, quote, the co color has weight. I'm black, poor, of a poor place. It is a factor that they take into account. It's not the same look you get if it's a blonde or Caucasian person with a, with a tattoo, right? Uh, the anthropologist, Professor Tahira Vargas, also in her very important article, Negritura y Seguridad Ciudadana, talks about racial profiling in the poor neighborhoods in Santo Domingo, a, very, a place very far away than the resorts that we think about in the tourist public imaginary in the West. Remember, in 2019, Dominican police detained more than 2,000 people in so-called raids, according to the National Commission of Human Rights in the DR. In New York City, we call that stop and frisk. As I conclude with my presentation, one of the questions uh, that I pose, and we can talk about later, is if we will see an increase in the self-identification of Afro-Dominicans of non-Haitian descent, but also at the same time while they collaborate with Dominicans of Haitian descent based on a common denominator of black skin uh, in a nation where historically black, where historically black has been synonymous with uh, Haitian and is seen as pejorative. So in closing, I think the Dominican Republic, like many societies, uh, you know, going through political and economic convulsions because of COVID, they're having a reckoning. And in the US, the reckoning, for example, uh, one way to look at it is the 1619 Project, which really uh, revealed a larger historic polemic, right? There were historians who supported it, historians who did it, but really it's this long historic debate about 
how do you interpret the Constitution? Is the Constitution about the ideals of liberty or was it really about slavery because slave owners signed it, right? And so in the Dominican Republic, you're seeing a similar struggle uh, regarding national identity. And if it will revolve around whether blackness will be embraced, a blackness connected to Haiti by a population that is overwhelmingly of African descent and informed by globalization and a diaspora that many of us consider ourselves part of the, of, of the African diaspora, whether we lack or, you know, because of colorism or gain more privilege, depending on context, um, or will the Dominican melting pot continue to accept everyone in the Dominican Republic and its immigrants um, and its mosaic of diasporas, except for Haiti? Thank you very much. Thank you, Ben, uh, for um, that intervention and for making us think about how uh, the relationship between uh, the DR and, and Haiti fit into this um, national discourse of anti-Blackness, which we have then different flavors or, of, or different manifestations throughout the Caribbean. And um, in, in continuing with this framework, you know, of going from Puerto Rico with the first two speakers and then taking it to a, a broader um, Caribbean uh, outlook, we're gonna have now Chantal Verna, uh, who's an associate professor uh, at, the at the Department of History at Florida International University. And her work, uh, the work of Chantal focuses on culture of foreign relations, uh, on the culture of foreign relations, specifically concerning Haiti and, and the United States uh, during the mid 20th century. And she is the author of a book entitled Hate, Haiti and the Uses of America. Uh, post US occupation promises. So while Ed talked to us about, you know, the, the, the tension and, and relationship between the DR and Haiti, Chantal is then going to give us, you know, uh, a perspective about Haiti vis a vis the, the US uh, and other angles that she's going to be exploring. So I'm very happy to introduce you to Chantal. And, and Chantal, you have, you have the floor. Go on. Thank you. Thank you so much. And thank you for the invitation to participate. Um, uh, it's great to be able to talk about the connections between different um, places in the Caribbean and its relationship to Black Lives Matter. Uh, I want to start also with a little bit of a biographical reference. Uh, and, you know, that is thinking about myself growing up and how I um, was raised. And also in terms of uh, my development as a scholar, I did my work in Michigan at Michigan State University in a comparative black history program. And one of um, my, you know, my, my first mentor there, Richard Thomas, he used to say something to many of us, which was the most revolutionary thing we can do is to raise a family. And there are many ways that that, that, that phrase really resonates with me. And uh, today I'll make reference to it specifically in terms of the founding and the development of the Haitian um, nation. And so thinking about the nation as a family, <clears throat> which um, you know, many of us uh, in, in academia have talked about with, re um, with reference to um, Benedict Anderson's imagined community. Uh, um, but really, again, when we think about blackness, thinking about that across, um, across um, you know, different lines and the importance of those types of connections uh, is really what is allowing the, the, the outcry, the public outcry that's taking place right now, um, there to be a lot more traction. And I think it's because many people are talking about it and many people are beginning to, to see those connections. So, you know, growing up, I was born and raised of um, two Haitian parents with a Haitian, strong Haitian community uh, in Queens, New York. And I was raised to, identify as Haitian American, very proudly raised as Haitian American. And um, what that really helped me to do uh, was to be, to have that affirmative blackness as one of my um, good friends and colleagues, Andrea Queerly, who's an anthropologist, um, has helped me to really appreciate the value of that, that phrase about an affirmative blackness. And I think that uh, in this moment when we're talking about Black Lives Matter, um, much of what my uh, colleagues have talked about today in terms of eliminating silences, eliminating erasures, 
uh, within our everyday lives, uh, those are the ways that our lives, not only um, in the very significant um, reference to black bodies that we've been seeing um, in the news, but also into terms of um, our lives, right? The liveliness, the language that we speak, um, the foods that we eat, our culture, and of course our history and our heritage, uh, which is what we have an opportunity to do, to do today. And so Haiti serves as a um, very important point of entry. And I wanted to share for um, those who may be less familiar, um, right? So. I think more increasingly popular is the fact that in 1804, revolutionaries um, with it from the colony of Saint-Domingue uh, revolted against, at that time, um, the colonial presence of France and um, you know, between 1791 through 1804 ensued um, a battle not only against France, but also against Britain, Spain, really a global, <laughs> you know, a global, um, global war against uh, slavery, against colonialism, against oppression. And so um, there are many who talk about how the Haitian revolution uh, serves as really the beginnings of what we understand today as uh, human rights, right? Un um, really pushing for the universal human rights, um, much more progressively than what had happened within the United States um, in terms of its anti-colonial struggle. Um, and of course, much more um, um, progressive than what, what had been taking place in France and speaking about the rights of man. Of course, um, scholars who are engaging um, with the question of the Haitian Revolution help us to complicate um, you know, our romanticism about the revolution that yes, um, it, was, it is one of the single most significant um, elements within, um, within history, but that there are many other uh, threads in that history that remain to be said. Uh, you know, one that that just comes to mind was speaking with my colleague Jean Casimir, Haitian sociologist, um, earlier this week, and we were just talking about gender, right? So the work of individuals such as Grace um, Sanders Johnson on um, women in Haitian history is an example of things that are really important to bring to the fold. So immediately following that independence in 1804, by 1805, ha Haitians established a constitution, and there's a really interesting line in the constitution that um, I want to just draw your attention to. And just collapsing it a bit, it's, there's a phrase in there that says, and I believe it's in the second article, it says, all children of one and the same family, the Haitians shall henceforth be known as Blacks. The Haitians shall henceforth be known as Blacks, right? All children, one of the same families. And, you know, that phrase is, is very significant very significant because I think at a time where we are now living uh, social distancing, uh, what many of my co-panelists have, have done a really excellent job of highlighting today is that really historically, um, what, has been, what has happened and what continues to this present day is racial distancing, right? This um, attempt to, and, and uh, concerted effort, both consciously and unconsciously to distance from blackness. And so this current movement of Black Lives Matter asserting the, the, the humanity of, of Black men and women, asserting the humanity of our, of our lives, um, these are the ways that, um, that we are saying to approach that, to, um, to be in relationship with and to affirm Blackness, right? Those are things that are moving, um, in, uh, again, towards blackness as opposed to the distancing that historically so many, you know, this has been an assault um, in, in so many different ways, which I really appreciate several of the examples that our, our panelists um, have presented. So uh, I've gotten a, a little bit ahead of myself. What I wanted to just um, say is that, uh, you know, I wanted to just open up with that in indication, indication of, you know, what, what is the basis upon which the Haitian um, state was founded and the Haitian nation had been founded. And then what, what significance, significance does it have for us today? And, and, um, and how is this you know, playing out on the ground? And um, as I was said, I, you know, I'm a scholar who works on the connections between Haiti and the United States in particular, but I'm very much just interested more broadly in just this idea of Haiti and the world. Because what we see is from its founding, even from its colonial period, there have been connections. And so I want to speak, spend a little bit more time specifically talking about those connections and then um, talking about why those connections matter um, for us today and, and how they really are in sync with 
uh, what we're, we're observing. So from what I've shared uh, about Haitian history and what many people may already be familiar with with regards to Haitian history, um, what happens is a, a, there tends to be an exceptionalism, right? There tends to be a celebration of Haiti and its, and its history. And, um, and in that moving towards a, an exceptionalizing of, of uh, what has happened historically on the island and still looking at um, Haitians in, in, in exceptional ways. And um, while, again, uh, I by no means want to um, minimize, right, um, the significance of, of, of the history, and I'll speak a little bit also about beyond 1804, because I think that's important. Uh, what I think is also important is, and I'm very committed to in my own work, is moving beyond exception and really emphasizing connections. Because what happens is, um, again, in whether it is um, by celebrating Haiti or by um, um, stereotyping or critiquing Haiti or Haitians, um, as, as Eddie has talked about, right? Um, what I'm what my, I'm committed to is really bringing Haiti back into the center because throughout history, ha Haiti Haitians, men and women, have been at the center of so much. Um, again, I gave the example of the Haitian Revolution, and so just to you know to do a little bit of again back and forth between. Um, the personal and this and this historical, you know, growing up being raised to be very proud of Haitian, of being Haitian American, there was also for me as there were for um, many other Caribbean people or just any other I would say immigrant um, individuals from immigrant populations. This also this again what I talked about the racial distancing. Uh, don't be like the Black Americans. I was very you know, that was very common that you would hear that. And it's not surprising for me to hear other people talk about when they were growing up this idea. And so what did that mean? Um, and, it's, and it may also be very curious and distinct for people who are living now, um, right? Maybe people who I'm probably just dating myself now, familiar with Wyclef Jean, the Fugees, that's not so new anymore, right? That's from um, the 90s. But even um, from you know prominent literary writers such as Edwidge Dantika or now um, uh, Naomi Osaka, you know, just like thinking about celebrities, um, Jason Derulo. I'm not sure if he if he identifies publicly as, as Haitian. Um, so that again, again, dating myself in terms of being out of connection with some of the more contemporary pop culture. But the point is that to be Haitian and to you know now you have all of, also all of these celebrities celebrating. Um, celebrating Haiti and, and being on board with advocating for Haiti, um, these are things that were not necessarily um, were not necessarily present. Right? That these are things that are more contemporary, but they are part of a longer history of connections between Haiti and the rest of the world. That historically there have been these alliances. Um, Eddie made reference to alliances between Dominican and Haitians. I mean, I think it's just, just an important example. You know, on the island, there's so much there. We we hear so much and we witness the tensions, and the reality is that these are the alliances that have um, there have been alliances throughout his history, and these are the alliances that that facilitate Haitian change, right? So for a Haitian state to be founded on the idea of um, all children of one of the same family coming together to be identifying as blacks gives us an opportunity to remember that the revolutionary things, the, ch the, the major social changes that we want to be able to see is to be, for those who are in fact black, uh, not to distance themselves, to identify with black. And for those who are aware or have an opportunity to be in solidarity to also then uh, identify or associate and reinforce celebrating uh, the way that blackness has, ha has happened and so within, within Haiti, um, we see that in terms of with African-Americans and their struggle within the United States um, during the 19th century in particular, um, the opportunity to emigrate and, and move to Haiti and to be able to um, establish a new life for themselves. Again, avoiding romanticizing, romanticizing Haiti, avoiding the sort of exceptionalism issues of class and language complicated that history and made it difficult for the full integration of some members of that population. But the, the, the essence is the way that the, these were some of the vehicles, right? Some of the ways that individuals from two different societies recognize in each other an opportunity to collaborate 
and to challenge um, global white supremacist ideas and global white supremacist thinking. Uh, we see that most significantly also um, during the US occupation and then the period that follows, not only in, in Haiti, but also across the Americas, you see the rise of using tapping into folklore culture to assert the links to um, heritage, um, blackness. Um, you know, as I already talked about, we're not gonna go into the indigenous question, right? But that's part of it um, in terms of celebrating a folk identity. And then in, in my um, more recent research, I'm beginning to look at the presence of Haitian professionals who migrated to the Congo and other places in Africa during the post-World War II period. Um, and you know, specific, specifically being hired to work for the United Nations in different um, institutional capacities in the decolonizing moment, in the moment where um, these independent African states, uh, these um, African territories were moving from colonial territories to be, to reclaiming their autonomy as independent African states. And so each of these different moments are, uh, are examples of um, where blackness has, ha identifying with blackness has been served as a political project to assert again, the humanity of, of, of the black experience and to challenge um, white supremacist ideas. And so you see that same opportunity happening for us today um, in, in terms of what, uh, how people are being able to identify with themselves. And, um, and, and so of course, again, to avoid any sort of um, oversimplification of the issue, it's important to note that um, we have a range of individuals uh, um, in the country, uh, in Haiti. And so, of course, there are different experiences. And so one of the interesting things that has come up um, as I've talked to um, people on the island during this period in terms of the significance of the Black Lives Matter for this moment is how um, it is at once being um, tapped into by um, a, a marginalized elite, right? A, an elite that sees itself as being marginalized um, when at the very moment, um, um, there are the majority of the population, which is, um, you know, unequivocally, uh, phenotypically, and also as been discussed today in terms of structural racism, um, experience, you know, the inequities that, that, that blacks, right? The inequity of blackness towards blackness, anti-blackness, um, um, being able to really say, um, okay, there's an outcry now for one segment of the population, but what happens when the larger majority of the population day in and day out, uh, right? You see the image behind me, the laboring class. What happens when day in and day out, the laboring class um, is not valued, is not, um, their humanity is not recognized. And so I think that's also um, important just to add to say that the, the, the success of the Haitian revolution came about because of a coming together across classes, uh, coming, uh, coming together across color and linguistic uh, boundaries. And so those are going to be um, the same types of alliances that are needed. Um, intersectional alliances are needed in order for there to be success at, of, of revolution at any point, right? Going back to all and one of the same family, um, really being able to identify in blackness and, and really being able to, to see our humanity. I want to, um, you know, just point also to another um, example that, interestingly enough, I think kind of brings things a little bit full cir circle with regards to what I was sharing as being uh, an individual of, of Haitian American ancestry, somebody who, um, you know, grew up in the United States, had the privilege of, of traveling to Haiti regularly and getting to know Haiti from that personal perspective and then professionally doing research in Haiti, being able to, um, to know through the history, deepening of my history, what those, you know, to be able to become even aware of these connections that I'm talking to you about today and that I continue to pursue in my research and in my teaching. And so one of our, one of the major ways that this um, Black Lives Matters and our current um, health pandemic is coming out, right, the pandemic of racism and the pandemic of COVID-19 is uh, we're experiencing it right now is through um, deportation. So um, Eddie made reference to the uh, repatriation of Haitians from the Dominican Republic to Haiti. But we also in this very moment have um, 
we've been having uh, several uh, repatriations of uh, Haitians uh, here in the United States, be people being deported, right? So this is part of this, um, again, uh, attempt to whiten the United States by sending back um, individuals um, to uh, to their to their homelands. Even though for many of the individuals who are being uh, repatriated, they may not have they have may have lived here all of their life, right? Um, they may their their families may completely be integrated within this society. And so I just want to draw attention to. Um, two organizations, one on this side of, of the question and one based in Haiti that I hope that people who are interested can pursue if they'd like to offer support. And here in the United States, um, led by um, Gerlin Joseph, who you can follow at Gerlin M. Joseph on Twitter and Haitian Bridge on Facebook, the Haitian Bridge Alliance. So I've really been um, grateful to learn about their work as they, um, they lobby against um, the deportation of Haitians to um, Haiti in this particular uh, moment. And our organization in South Florida, um, FUM, which is the Family Action Network of Miami, led by Marlene Bastien. You know, these are organizations that have been lobbying against the, um, it, in you, you know, the, the inhumane process of uh, deporting people in this particular moment of pandemic. First of all, those people find themselves at risk in the process of being de deported and, and or being in these uh, detention spaces um, because of the poor conditions of those, those locations. And then secondly, a place like Haiti who had very, very low numbers in the beginning um, has been having increasingly higher numbers and, and those risks have been um, amplified by, um, you know, again, exporting from the United States, COVID to, to Haiti, um, you know, and from, again, locations that are, are, are bringing um, this current disease at risk, right? So creating an added strain on a, on a society that already has enough challenges already because of its um, long, um, long history of, of, of revolution and resistance to, um, the, you know, the white supremacist um, uh, systems and ideas that are part of our everyday society. And then on the Haiti side of the, of the equation, um, organizations such as GAR, um, which uh, G-A-R-R, which, you know, really supports um, refugees and people who are being repatri repatriated and really receiving um, these individuals who are, again may not have no one on the, on the island. And so, you know, these are some of the ways that we can really say that Black Lives Matter, that it's not just a small elite segment of the society. Um, it's not just in a romantic way that we think about Haiti and celebrating Haiti, um, but to really be aware of what is happening um, in the everyday struggles, to be an understanding of things such as pay um, look that really um, has been a, a pushback against current um, economic and political um, challenges to the very humanity of people on the island. So I'll stop there and I'm glad to take additional questions. Thanks so much for the opportunity to comment. Okay, uh, thank you so much Chantal for, for that intervention. Um, we have a lot of questions. I'm gonna see if uh, I can start my video um, and, then, and then we can pick up some of the uh, questions. Already we have about 13 and 14 questions that have been posed um, to us. And so um, let me see if I can, okay, there we go, great. Okay, thank you. So um, uh, I'm gonna try and just make some very brief comments to, to identify some common threads um, uh, among these uh, four um, panelists uh, and thanking them again for, for taking the time and, and, and effort to, to put this uh, commentary together. Um, and then we can just open it up for questions. Since we already have some questions there, I'm gonna, I'm gonna post them uh, to you and then we can 
we can take them. But but just to a brief comment on what I think are some you know running themes through what we've been uh, discussing is this idea that in in the Caribbean, especially in the Hispanic Caribbean, in in the DR and in Puerto Rico, you know, when we hear uh, Maria Teresa. Uh, Saide and Eddie talk about the DR in Puerto Rico, we see there's a consistency in telling us that the idea of the nation itself was founded on anti-blackness, you know, on, on, on the idea of, of this distancing from, from blackness that, that Chantal talks to us about. And, and she conveys to us, you know, that the idea is then, you know, if we take the Black Lives Matter movement as, a, as, as an inspiration, to not move away from blackness, but towards blackness um, through, you know, through practices of collaboration that extend beyond national boundaries. But, but really, Maria Teresa, Saide, and Eddie both speak to the importance of this agenda, specifically for the Hispanic Caribbean, since um, the idea of nation itself has been sort of founded on anti-blackness, even though there is a rhetoric of mestizaje of you know uh, mixture etc but when you look at what that rhetoric is doing is actually a rhetoric of whitening it's actually a, a rhetoric of silencing uh blackness and and i really like the way that side both side and chantal brought in their personal narratives you know as a way to to uh to show how you know either the affirmative <laughs> blackness is there uh, within the families, but in the case of Saide, those are specifically the narratives that then are not counted as, as being part of, of the nation, um, even though they are very Caribbean uh, uh, in, uh, in their, you know, constituency. So, so that was a running theme, you know, this idea of nationalism as, as an anti-Blackness project. And then the role of the state, you know, the, the, the this notion of systemic racism and how the states in the DR and the, the Dominican Republic also in the US, you know, keep um, reaffirming this either through anti Haitianism in the DR, you know, and how COVID, uh, the, the epidemic is, is then, um, you know, uh, affecting uh, more the black population there because of the, the state's um, uh, strategies urban planning in Puerto Rico and how it reproduces um, the, the racial hierarchies, as, as, as Saida says, data on race that shows that systematically, you know, Black populations are at a disadvantage, uh, but the, the state itself is not publishing this data, it's not, it keeps saying that it's too difficult and too, too confusing to document, which is another way of silencing the problem, and the deportation of Haitians, you know, as as uh, Chantel is, is telling us is happening in the U.S. So these are all the ways in which state apparatuses, you know, in, in the Caribbean are, are um, uh, contributing to this. So I thought that was another running theme. And then, you know, the idea that we have to counter this through um, looking beyond our national boundaries, like Chantal said, you know, looking at the connections. And I think uh, also uh, Ana Teresa mentioned this, this idea of the exceptionalism, you know, in Puerto Rico, like, no, we're different. You know, this is a problem of the US, this racism is, is happening elsewhere, but this doesn't uh, concern to us. And then in Haiti, you see another uh, narrative of, of exceptionalism. And, 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 and I guess uh, all of you, including Sari, are, are inviting us to look at these things, you know, uh, regionally. Uh, beyond national boundaries to then um, foster those, those anti-racist connections that are necessary. So I'm gonna, um, we have so many questions. <laughs> it's, it's, it's a really a challenge to see how to tackle all of them. But um, so far, I'm gonna try and post them to the panel in, in groups uh, and see if we can get through most of them. I have a series of questions on uh, Puerto Rico and blackness, um, uh, and and so some of them, some of the questions address issues of collaborations and, and associations of Puerto Rico, Puerto Ricans in the diaspora, and 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 uh, and other uh, groups. So 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 for some, someone asked uh, about the connections between Roberto Clemente and Martin Luther King. Uh, spending both time in Puerto Rico and how each of them influenced their thinking. So talking again about 
this is an example of those connections, transnational connections that we are talking about. Uh, and then, then someone else uh, talked about that in the context of Chicago, um, whites uh, associated Boricuas with blackness and, and vile terms used against Puerto Ricans in Chicago also were used about against black Americans. So again, we, we see how in the diaspora, even though locally, there is this pull uh, in Puerto Rico to distance uh, the national, the nation, the idea of the nation from blackness in, in, in the United States, sometimes they are, um, you know, uh, overlap. Um, so there's also another set of questions about mestizaje and anti-racism. Uh, a question, someone raised a question about when is the, is, is there gonna be an Afro-Puerto Rican curriculum uh, in, in, in Puerto Rico, uh, supported by the Department of Education. Again, again, the idea of a state in its role in combating uh, racism. And uh, another person wanted to know about uh, anti-racist organizations in, in Puerto Rico, which there are in fact a, a lot. Uh, uh, so um, they wanted to know about that. And then I have a, question, a series of questions for, for Sari, for Saire, for Ed, uh, for, for Chantal. So I don't know how to um, go about taking those, but I already post some. Uh, and then maybe I can, uh, as, as you start answering those that I post, we can organize the, the other ones. So, so just to, you know, to recap, I have a question about Boricuas collaborating with African Americans, you know, in the diaspora. Uh, I have another question about education uh, in, in Puerto Rico and uh, about anti-racist organizations in Puerto Rico. Wh what are they doing? What, what are they, um, what is their agenda? So those for now, and then I'm gonna try and organize the, other, the others that I, that I have here. So I'm just going to open. If you want to turn on your cameras and your microphones. Sí. Eh, puedo puedo comenzar esto abordando algunos de esos temas que traes. Eh, una de las cosas que, que me interesaba traer en la conversación es la cuestión de que si sí hay una experiencia eh, específica del Caribe y específica de, de Puerto Rico y específica de América Latina que tiene que ver con cómo opera el racismo en nuestra región y cómo opera el racismo también eh, que tiene un poco primero que probarse a sí mismo eh, y pasar por ese eh, agotador proceso de casi demostrar evidencia de que esto está ocurriendo para que entonces luego la conversación pueda adelantar. Pero eso no nos exime de haber tenido en el caso de Puerto Rico en particular esto y obviamente eh, en el resto del Caribe un contacto permanente con cómo opera eh, eh, este sistema en los Estados Unidos y, y la participación que han tenido los puertorriqueños en los procesos antirracistas en los Estados Unidos. Eh, hay alguien curioso con el tema de Roberto Clemente, de hecho fue aquí en Río Grande donde me encuentro ahora mismo, donde vivo, eh, a donde Martin Luther King vino a visitar a Clemente, eh, él tenía una finca en esta zona, eh, y eso lo sé por la primera línea de su familia, mi esposo es actor, y ha estudiado eh, muy de cerca la familia de Clemente, este personaje, y ellos tienen esa historia eh, documentada. Eh, no solo eh, en, en esa experiencia de Puerto Rico, o sea, Roberto Clemente, al ser, eh, digamos, uno de los primeros en, en que podríamos ir llamando afrolatinos eh, prominentes en la cultura estadounidense, eh, vivió eh, la misma experiencia allá que acá y se, se, se conectó con esa lucha. Eso por un lado. En cuanto a las organizaciones antirracistas, eh, debiera decir que hay muchos puntos de partida. Uno de los trabajos más importantes que han hecho recientemente eh, es del colectivo ILE, eh, también está la revista étnica, también está la cátedra de mujeres ancestrales. O sea, la, la lista de organizaciones antirracistas es bastante larga. Yo siempre recomiendo, eh, pues la revista étnica es muy reciente y siempre tiene una documentación de lo que están haciendo eh, los grupos antirracistas en Puerto Rico, pero uno de los más interesantes eh, y tiene que ver con, con lo que comentaba Zaire en su ponencia 
es una lucha con el tema del censo. Eh, aquí se ha invitado y se ha hecho una campaña muy poderosa por parte del colectivo ILE para que los puertorriqueños y las puertorriqueñas nos identifiquemos en el, centro, en el censo como afrodescendientes. En, en la columna de lo que sería el write-in, de donde colocas eh, tu identidad, eh, escribas afrodescendiente, con varias intenciones, esto obviamente... Eh, Dar, dar cuenta de una experiencia eh, y sobre todo eh, contrarrestar lo que pasó en el anterior censo en el que la mayoría de los puertorriqueños se pensaban blancos. Eso dice muchísimo de la psiquis del país, eso dice muchísimo de las narrativas de poder, nuevamente como bien las planteaba Zaire al, al, al mostrarnos ese retrato perturbador eh, de los de las personas que han dirigido el país. Entonces, hay mucho trabajo en ese sentido. También hay mucho trabajo eh, con la niñez. Yo reconozco la obra de Yolanda Arroyo Pizarro, una escritora puertorriqueña que escribe libros de cuentos para niños con títulos como Pelo Bueno, por ejemplo, eh, instando a trabajar los temas de la autoestima, los temas de... Eh, eh, de, de, de los conflictos raciales que se dan y desde el plano del periodismo, que es el, el que me compete más eh, y uno de los más que me interesa, eh, creo que ha sido muy interesante eh, el hecho de que algunos periodistas, esto, entre ellos destacaría Benjamín Torrecotay del Nuevo Día, han decidido asumir posturas abiertamente antirracistas, en el caso, por ejemplo, de la niña eh, Alma Yariela, eh, que fue eh, vilmente procesada eh, por la justicia del país esto, cuando decide defenderse tras ser víctima de bullying por el tema racial en la escuela. Es una niña que ha vivido un calvario, eh, que de hecho ese calvario inicia, lo inicia eh, la gobernadora Wanda Vázquez cuando era la secretaria de Justicia. Eh, y obviamente es una historia que tiene un claro perfil eh, de discrimen racial y ha habido periodistas que han esto, llamado las cosas por su nombre porque esa es otra de las grandes carencias, eh, que, que no, se, no se llama eh, un ataque racista siempre como lo que es. Entonces eso es algo que sí ha pasado y ha sido interesante ver eh, cómo cada vez más periodistas han dado un paso al frente y se han colocado eh, en el lado correcto de la historia, que es en la lucha antirracista, desde las grandes plataformas mediáticas eh, que algunos de ellos y ella ostentan. Eh, podría seguir, pero quisiera dejar eso sobre la mesa. Sí, gra gracias este, a Ana Teresa. De hecho, esta es una pregunta que alguien tiene para todos los panelistas que quieren que hablen, y gracias por empezar ¿verdad? a hablar de los esfuerzos militantes ¿verdad? Que, se han, que se están haciendo Mencionaste algunos en Puerto Rico, hay alguien aquí que quiere saber qué se está haciendo en la República Dominicana, ¿verdad? Para reescribir la historia oficial a nivel popular y no solamente académica. Este, así que si, si Ed, si quieres hablar un poco de, de eso. And, and Chantal, if you have any uh, comments on, on what is being doing, uh, what are the anti-racist efforts in, in Haiti? Uh, that, that you could further comment on, and, and Saire, if you want to also elaborate on anything else that you know is happening in Puerto Rico, since this is a question someone wanted to um, to ask to, to all of you about anti-racist organizations and movements, efforts, etc. Ed, Ed, you want to start with what's happening in the DR to counter? Uh, regarding, I kind of lost you for a second there. Uh, okay, so so someone is wanting to know what are the some of the militant efforts, verdad? The esfuerzos militantes en República Dominicana para reescribir la historia oficial a nivel popular y no solamente académico. Could we have, you know, all the panelists uh, for this part? So so she he, he's writing, you know, he's asking about. What are some efforts, anti-racist efforts, to convey a different version of history that is not that doesn't support white supremacy? Uh, there are several organizations in in the DR that uh, are working toward that end. Uh, and you would call that uh, from the activist perspective. Uh, like you have uh, reconocido, as I mentioned, you also have Muda, which was founded by the late. Uh, human rights activist Sonia Pierre, who was a Dominican of Haitian descent. She also was the 
recipient of the 2006 Robert F. Kennedy Humanitarian Award. Uh, so these are kind of pillars who, who were, were at the vanguard years ago at uh, uh, kind of uh, fighting for for equal rights and citizen rights. There is also, as I mentioned, Obmika Ob with Bridget Wooding. There is Sahil. Um, uh, and they are at the level of of uh, trying to shape policies, but in the end, the, the, the organisms that, or the institutions that have power, like the Junta Central Electoral and the government, you need to pass laws, right? Uh, if you wanna change a curriculum, you have to go to the department, of, uh, you know, the Secretary of Education to say, look, we have a trust fund of this amazing human contribution that have people who are of African descent at the very, right, crux of independence and rebellion. Uh, you know, why don't we underscore that, right? It's like Ghana has figured out, you know, to create revenue to bring in right, African Americans for these to, re to return to the homeland. Uh, you know, wh whether it's the right homeland, you know, whether it's more south in, in Angola is another question. But the thing is, could you imagine, you know, being able to embrace this history and having people visit the Dominican Republic, uh, you know, with all the issues that it has, but in terms of bearing witness and saying, I want to go on uh, the National Historic Trail of, uh, you know, runaways, the same, in the same way, kind of, but in the Dominican flavor, what we see in the United States. If you go to Portsmouth, New Hampshire, is, you know, the, you have the National Black Historic Trail, right? Uh, or the Underground Railroad. I mean, it's not, you're not making it up. You know, it's like the Dominican Republic has a trust fund when it comes to people of African descent. And it's just, it, it, the question is, you know, whether they will and have the political courage to embrace it. Uh, also, people supporting uh, kind of against white supremacy and uh, kind of equal rights in the diaspora, there are, I wanna, I would be remiss if I didn't say we are all Dominican, they're an amazing organization, right? Um, Dominicans Love Haitians in Cultured Company by France Francois, Fundo Salud, Pate Relief Alliance, Border of Lights, etc. cetera. Um, so it is a kind of a transnational movement uh, and the cliche is true, right? If, if someone is, is unequal someplace, everyone is unequal. So, you know, activism is there. Uh, There's also Asue, which is Dominican and Haitian musicians that play together. So, but you really have to get to that level where you have a reckoning in terms of how you teach the next generation, right? Because if a, a seven-year-old today is saying anti-Haitian things, we lost them, right? So uh, those are just some of the organizations. Um, Mm -hmm. Okay. Yep. Thank you, Ed. I, I want to I, I um, get to Saire because there's a couple of questions that were made to Saire as well. Uh, and in terms of, you know, anti-racist efforts, someone asked if we, if we should focus on the lack of housing. You know, like, what are your thoughts on homelessness and race in Puerto Rico and state private efforts to make those without a home out of place and, and also incarceration? So again, we're getting questions about the, the role of the state in 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 encounter in encountering racism and what it's doing or not doing. So, if you could speak to that, uh, and also someone um, wanted to uh, you to explain the blood quantum concept. Uh, so, how is it different in Puerto Rico? Um, you know, this idea of, of the blood quantum that you mentioned in your talk. So, those are two two. Um, the questions I have. Yeah. So those are those are big questions. Um, mm. I'll, I'll start saying I'll start um, talking about this idea of what kind of work um, we might be imagining or moving towards in addressing racism. I think that it's interesting to point out the organizations. It's good to point out the organizations that have been taken this this fight and this struggle and uh, they're not only existing today, but there is a, you know, from the South Africa Conference of Racism in 2001, that where we really got to see that this has been an, uh, a hemispheric, right? Like struggle 
um, with that Afrodescendientes have been, you know, going at for, um, you know, for decades. Uh, and uh, and it really, if you think about it in the context of Maronage, right, like for things being here, right, like this, is, this has been a struggle. I think that precisely the lack of um, state engagement has been one of the major issues. And so I work on policy, right? Like that's my orientation mm -hmm. and that's my, what my work is trying to um, kind of center. And I think that uh, there are many struggles, right? And there are many realms in which race manifests and uh, shows itself, right? And perpetuates itself, race inequality. And so while I think some of the and, and, and we have to think about how those different different objectives might actually collide against each other. So the census, I think, is a great example of that. So there's an effort to identify blackness because we're appalled by Puerto Ricans identifying as white, right? We're appalled by that um, because we are, in fact, and this is where I'm going to bring the blood quantum conversation, right? We think, we still think of it as a mixed nation. So I think there is um, uh, a question there about identity. Who are we? Are we mixed race? Are we, well, if if race is not real, right? Like if, if race is not real, then then it, it's, not, it's not biological. And that's what I mean by, by not real. It is absolutely real socially, mm -hmm. but biologically it is not real then we cannot necessarily say that people are mixed or afrodescendiente even, or white. But for purposes of social, right, this has been erected. People made it so that our people with dark skin and Africans, white supremacy, right, made it a political economic project, right, that demanded that people be enslaved to do the work for free to benefit um, so we have built this whole, right, like scenario, this whole scene, this whole society. And so if we recognize that that is a social construction, certainly in Puerto Rico is majority white society. I'm not saying that people are not have don't have a curl or don't have anything. Mm -hmm. So what we have to represent and capture, and this is where I think our policy orientation is merited, what we have to capture is who benefits? I don't care if they're a little quemaito, if they're trigueñito, if they're dark. It's a different project than identity, than an identity project. It is a related project, but we have to think about what is the argument to be made in the context of the state. So, so if we have, if tomorrow the census comes out and it says that, okay, Puerto Ricans went with it and decided that they were all black. Where does that get us? Mm -hmm. Doesn't get us very far. Because now all we're doing is doing the same thing. We're saying they're all white or we're saying they're all black. It's not real. We're nothing. We're people, right? Mm -hmm. But for the purposes of social inequality, the way people make decisions is, is, is as if this fiction is real. Mm -hmm. So I think that the approach here is to really recognize who benefits and who, um, and who doesn't and, and to rethink that from the purposes of advocating at the state level, right? Um, and so I, I think that that has been, I mean, I'm an academic and I don't, you know, I, I want to recognize the people who are in the trenches moving the conversation. I think we have a need to figure out how this becomes state effort, right? Like addressing the state. I thought a lot about like when um, uh, Ricky uh, uh, Rosello was ousted, right? Um, and, and let's call that a coup, right? Like when he was ousted valiantly, right? If the conversation had revolved around race, like what does that look like, right? Like what does it mean to make demands at the state level, uh, state level uh, uh, in that way. And that's a different conversation than let's all say we're Afrodescendientes. Now, respecting what that project on identity um, is. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. um, that's where I'm, 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 I'm that's what I'm, um, have been thinking about 
uh, mm -hmm. in terms of policy. And so blood quantum is a biological thing that is not real. Mm -hmm. um, it's the binary one drop rule in the US. Some people suggest that the, in the other parts or in the Caribbean or some parts of Latin America is the, is the inverse, is one drop of white makes you access white. Well, if, you know, I, there are different conversations around this, right? Like how white you are, the castas de Mexico, right? Um, but, but we have to really think about like where inequality is applied. And I would say that if we took different areas like education, housing, which is the, the question about housing is uh, obviously, I mean, if you look at different markers of housing, whether it's to be housed or not be housed, you will see racial patterns as well if we have the data to see it. So housing um, uh, in the area of criminal justice and criminalization, all of these areas perhaps lead to different breakdowns, I would argue, mm -hmm. um, racial break breakdowns where we might consider how race plays a part, right? So it's, it doesn't have to be uniform. It's not about who we are. I'm not black, it's about how I am treated as a black person, right? How I'm treated as, as if I'm black when I may go get an, an employment or a job or not prevented from accessing some educational resources. Right, it, it's about identifying vulnerability to, to racism and then and using that data to counter those those patterns. So thank you, Saide. And I, I wanna, I don't wanna leave Chantal since we have, you know, we're already at four o'clock and but Chantal, I mean, you, you talk about Haiti as, as you know, being at the center of, of, of narratives that can be affirming of blackness, you know, and, and here we have a discourse of mestizaje in the DR in, the, in, in, in Puerto Rico that is distancing itself from blackness. So how do you, how do you conceive in, in, your, in your, you know, um, uh, proposal that, that we can emphasize connections? How do you think Haiti uh, or a connection with Haiti can can help us think of a different kind of mestizaje that is not towards blanqueamiento, but it's uh, towards uh, you know affirming uh, affirming our blackness in a ways that brings us closer to an anti-racist agenda. Um, first of all, I just want to check on my connection. I'm having some connectivity issues, so I want to know. I called in on the phone. Can you hear me that way? Yes. I can hear you faintly, but I can hear you. <laughs> okay, you can, okay, okay, so that's good. At least this is working. <laughs> I don't know what it looks like on the other side, but at least you can hear me. Um, you know, I, I'm, I'm just going to again go back to the personal. I think it's a, I think it's a um, very powerful way, like I opened up, right, with my mentor about, um, about um, raising a family being the most revolutionary thing you can do. And, um, you know, Zaire had the amazing image in her slide. I don't know if you if you mentioned a little bit about it, and I and I missed it, but um, she had the picture of the blonde little blonde girl standing in front of this wall of dolls. I don't know if it's possible to bring that image up for anybody who may have missed it. Um, and if I was looking, I was really looking at it very closely. There were a lot of black and brown dolls in that image, and the reality is that you don't see that. <laughs> you know, I, I live in a predominantly um, black neighborhood. And if you, I was at the CVS the other day and um, I was with my daughter with two. And, and so this is heightening, of course, my awareness of this kind of thing. And, you know, and we are also in, in family spaces and there are no brown and black dolls for her. And so I'm like vigilantly trying to make sure she's right, that affirming blackness. So in terms of raising our families, um, in, in terms of supporting this, the young people around us, Eddie talked about that seven-year-old, right? What kind of images, what kind of stories, what kind of histories do they get to hear that they um, are exposed to so that, that they are affirmed and then they can see themselves again at the center? Um, again, if we really look at the history of Haiti and we look at the movements that are taking place in Haiti even today, um, they're connected to every sector of society. So it's uh, you know, to go back to the person who wanted to um, be engaged with uh, on the ground in Haiti, I would say anybody who's interested in connection, just think about what you're already doing. Think about already what you're already committed to. Is it your family? Is it um, issues of environmental justice? Is it issues of immigration? Whatever your point of entry is, right? Um, you will be able to, I'm, I'm certain, you will be able to identify somebody on the ground who is already doing that work. 
um, and and to really listen. I think that that, that is the one thing that um, I would like for us to do more of is to have people who are um, are based on the ground. I really appreciate each of my co-presenters here and the way that they're able to, to offer that um, so that we can get that voice. That's where the real connection comes. That's how it's not superficial and just uh, sort of saying, okay, now Kumbaya, now we're all together, you know, in, in affirming mm -hmm. Blackness, but really listening and experiencing and, and, and having the connection, right? For those of us who do this kind of work, those of us who have actually been on the ground and, and done field research in a country, right? Not just from a distance um, or maintaining conversations. I think those are the things. So um, there's so much now, thank goodness. I mean, I'm understanding that um, Twitter and Instagram, for example, are really super popular. I mean, the, in terms of there are digital divides, but there are also ways that the digital brings us together. And so there are ways that um, there's a presence. And then through music and culture, um, I, it was mentioned that I um, am a co-editor on the Haiti Reader, and one of the um, great parts of our reader, we collaborate with a lot of contributors, and um, uh, I'm, I don't want to massacre Chelsea's last name, but <laughs> there's a, um, you know, she did, she has done interviews and on the ground with people um, who are, um, you know, resisting the Baz, what is referred to as the Baz, right, um, and 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 also music that captures the uh, what is typically on the margins but is really instituting major change <clears throat> in country and so both in the urban spaces and in the rural spaces i think um that's part of also why besides the fact that i you know i wanted to bring a little bit of haiti into the imagery with the with the rural picture behind me but it's also about getting out of port au prince and paying attention to what's happening in different places of the countryside and really um, helping to amplify voices in that way. So those are just a few of the comments that I, that I would make. Okay, thank you, Chantal. Um, and uh, um, I, wanna, I wanna have some feedback from the organizers of the event as far as time, since uh, it's already four o'clock and uh, we had a, a series, you know, we had, we have 16 different questions. Uh, we've we've uh, we've tackled some of them, but there's still some that, uh, and I don't know if we have time. So if if you want to give me some feedback as to how to how to continue or leave it here, actually we should leave it here. And uh, um, but before we go, I just wanted to express my heartfelt thanks to all the panelists and our excellent moderator for sharing your important work with us. And I also wanted to thank everyone who made this event possible, particularly our partners at the University of Puerto Rico. Professor Juan Hernandez has helped us a lot with this um, collaboration. I also want to thank Liso Picard at Florida International University, Omar Daujaire at New York University, and Maggie Martinez and Patricia Alba at our very center here at the University of Florida. Thank you all so much. This is a very important conversation and this is just a, a start that uh, I hope we continue organizing events like this. Thank you all for attending. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It was great listening to all of you and learning so much from all of you. Thank you, Isar. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.